All right, y'all turn to Luke 5. We're going to pick up today in verse 27. And Lord willing, we'll finish this chapter out uh, today and maybe next week start on 6. Before we start, let's go to Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank You for the grace and the mercy that You show us constantly. Lord, we thank You for giving us Your Word that we might know Your Son through Your Spirit and that by, thereby we might know You, Father. We ask You today to open our hearts and minds that we might be brought unto You, that we might be drawn close to Your side, that we might be edified, built up, and strengthened by Your Word, that we might be faithful servants to the Lord Jesus Christ. In His name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's read from 27. <clears throat> And after these things, he went forth. Now remember, these things is, remember when he's healed the paralyzed man, they let down through the ceiling. And it picks up and says, After these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often, and make prayers, and like Likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. And he saith unto them, Can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. He spake also a parable unto them, No man putteth a piece of new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then, both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles, and be spilled, and the bottle shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also, having drunk old wine, straightway desireth the new, for he saith the old is better." All right, now let's just go back and deal with this a little at a time, but I want y'all to do uh, in your mind something as we're doing it. I want y'all to think about the call of Levi here, who, look, is almost certainly Matthew. Um, there are some of the older church fathers made an argument that this was uh, another Levi, and his name is Matthias, and he, they time to the one in Acts 1 that they replaced. I really don't see any legitimacy to that, but either way, I, it, this is almost certainly Matthew, okay? But anyway, I want y'all to compare the call of Matthew to the call of Abram. Now think about it. What was Matthew doing that day? Seeking the Lord? No, he was, he, was, he was going about life, doing his bit. Look, literally what he was doing was he was going about promoting self at the expense of others because that's what a tax collector did. The tax collector, Rome subcontracted out the collection of taxes. And look, they were the most heavily taxed people in history. They claim even comparing us. Now, I don't know if it's true or not. James might could tell us, but I've been told that we work through May to pay taxes. Is that basically true? Right. Even, even if you get a refund, you still better look at sales tax, vehicle tax. I mean, everything you do, we were just talking about going crabbing and what do you got to do? Buy a license. But the Jews had it much like that. Rome was taxing them to death. And they would subcontract out the tax collection areas and the people would bid on them. Now, the Jews were unfamiliar with exactly what was owed and they, they weren't you know experts in Latin law and whatnot. So the way that the subcontractors made their money was by overcharge. In other words, they tacked on. Okay? And so what Matthew basically did was he was seen as his, by his people as not only a thief, not only a turncoat because he's working with the Romans, but he's a man that above everything else is unclean and unacceptable. It'd be like if we had a party, who would invite an IRS auditor to your party? You say, no, nobody, right? <laughs> James Wood? <laughs> okay. Depends on what I need. Oh, what you need, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is much worse, okay? Much worse because, look, he, he's a thief. I mean, that's what he is. He is a thief, folks, and he's a professional thief. In other words, his thiefdom is protected by Rome, okay? It's a lot like a lot of what's going on today. Now, when we think about the call of Abraham, what was Abraham doing when God called him? 
He, and when he called, he listened. But right before he's called, what do we learn he was? He was an idol worshiper. His father was an idol maker. And so what I want you all to see is the election of God in this. Folks, Jesus called Matthew because Jesus wanted to call Matthew. And if you want to try and figure out the reason, well, then you're better than all the church theologians that have ever lived. <laughs> we don't know the reason. God said it's according to His good purpose. But anyway, in this we've got number one, election. <clears throat> now remember Jesus told the apostles. He said, you have not chosen me, I've chosen you. And He didn't mean just the apostles. He means any child of God. He says, no man can come unto Him except the Father draw him. Well, when the Father draws someone, one, that tells us right away that the Father has already chosen that person. But the second thing is effectual calling. Now this is what the old timers called it, effectual calling. You know, the call of the gospel goes out to everybody, doesn't it? We don't, we, don't, we don't look around, at least we're not supposed to look around and pre-qualify certain ones and say, I think that's a good candidate. No, we just preach the gospel and it goes out everywhere. Jesus said like a net. Well, what does a net bring in? All, All sorts of stuff. Jesus said, I'll sort through and toss out what I don't want. Well, in the effectual call, Paul said in Romans 8 that God foreknew some people. And of those He foreknew, He predestinated them to be conformed to the image of His Son. How many did God foreknow that He also predestinated? All of them. And all of them that He predestinated, there came a time when God was ready to call them. And so what did He do to all of them? He called them. And what did they do? They responded, they responded to the call. This is the specific call of God. I mean, y'all just think, is it normal for a stranger to walk by and say, follow me, and you abandon everything and follow him? Nothing normal about it, is it? It's also not normal for a man to leave his hometown, his family, his living, everything he's ever known, his inheritance, the whole nine yards, and go who knows where. Because what did God tell Abraham? Come go with me. Where, Lord? I'll show you later. Now, who would answer that call? It's not natural, is it? It's supernatural. And in Matthew's case, come follow me. Follow him where? Matthew has no idea, does he? So this is, again, I want you all to think of those things. Now, in Luke, he uses the name Levi. And, of course, Matthew himself uses Matthew. He's called the son of Alphaeus. And Mark uses Matthew. I think there's probably a reason why Luke uses Levi. Now, look, it's not unusual for the Jews to have two names. I don't think it was a surname. They were very common to have a Hebrew name and then a Latin or a Greek name. And yet him using Levi is probably very specific. Notice how he went on to, to compare Matthew's call or Levi's call to a bridegroom. And, and what in the world is he talking about with a bridegroom and a bride chamber and a feast? What had just happened with Matthew? He had just responded to an invitation. And later on, what does Christ liken that invitation to? To a wedding invitation. Well, guess what? Matthew's part of the bride. He's been invited unto a wedding. So if y'all would, go back to Genesis 29. Look, lots of the times in the Scripture, the first time something is mentioned, if you will just look at it and study it, it will give us an indication of how it will be used. In other words, it's kind of a clue to how it will appear throughout the Scripture. And uh, we're going back here to the birth of the, the twelve sons of uh, Jacob. And we read in, uh, it's Leah's having children. And in verse 34, Genesis 29, 34, She conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons, therefore his name is called Levi. Levi means joined unto, and it's like a woman is joined unto her husband, right? A spouse, put together. Now when Matthew responds to the call, what's happening? He's being put together with Christ, folks. This is what's going on. So back over there to Luke 5. Verse 
Now, when we read Matthew's account, it's kind of interesting. Someone once said, this is a, a famous old saying, but if you've never seen it, you'll have to look up a picture of it. It's interesting. You know, Rembrandt must have been a believer. I mean, certainly he professed to be because most of his paintings were Bible scenes. But he painted one, The Raising of the Cross. Y'all can check it out. There's several of them like it, but one of them, they're raising up the cross. And when he painted that, people kept looking at it and they couldn't figure it out. They said, well, okay, I recognize this character and that character and that character, but who is this guy in the blue hat at the foot of the cross? Guess who it was? It was Rembrandt. Rembrandt put himself there because he said it was my sins also that caused him to go on. And there he is. If you look at a picture of him, you'll see this guy standing there in a blue hat. And it's Rembrandt. Well, when Matthew tells this story, it's a lot like that. Matthew's telling about the call of himself. And he leaves some of the things out which make sense because he doesn't brag that he left everything. He's being humble. But Luke tells us that he left everything. Now, we've got election, we've got the calling, but we've also got repentance. Don't ever believe that repentance comes before regeneration. It does not. Repentance comes after and repentance goes on. In other words, we go on repenting, don't we? Don't you find that we have to constantly repent? Amen. We do, don't we? And so what's really happening here is that we're told that God grants us repentance. Well, when did He repent? What does repent mean? Turn around. To turn around. It's literally to turn from, from what you are trusting, believing, and doing and turn unto what God would have you trust, believe, and do. Now, does Matthew do that? Yes. Folks, Matthew drops everything and goes, okay, immediately now. Saving faith. He also believes, doesn't he? How do we know he believes? Y'all see the word follow there? In the Greek, it's a present imper or imperfect participle. And what that means is he went on following. You know, it's a shame we don't get these over in the English just like they are. But in other words, he didn't follow him for a day and go back. He didn't follow him for a week or a month or six years. How long did he follow him? The rest of his life. His faith was real. It was enduring faith. So he follows. Do y'all think Matthew was that studious a fellow? Reckon he was that strong-willed? No, folks, he's a crook. Then what's causing him to follow Christ? Christ, okay? Now, another thing, worship, communion. When we get God calls us and literally we answer the call, it's Him enabling us to answer it because we're told faith itself is a gift. So then what's the immediate response? You begin to praise God, don't we? Now, we don't praise Him with the same fervor at all times, but look what's the first thing we read about Him. It says 28, He left all, rose up, and followed him, and Levi made him a great feast in his own house. Why did he make him a feast? He's praising him, folks. He's doing something for him. He's worshiping him. But what else is he doing? He's eating with the Lord. Immediately after salvation, what do we do? We sit down at the Lord's table and we begin to eat of the bread of life. And we have communion with Christ. Literally, He's sitting down at a wedding table with Him, sharing a meal. And then the last thing He does, it says, It was in His own house. There was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. What's the last thing Levi did in the story after being saved? He told his friends. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Folks, this is what we do, isn't it? And we tell our friends, and generally speaking, our friends are going to react like the Pharisees react. <laughs> okay? In this case, the publicans come. So th this is the steps that we go through. Now, a publican, again, is a tax collector. He's the worst of the Jewish population. The, the thing that they would say about him in the Jewish Talmud was this, sinfully rich and socially ostracized. That's how they referred to him. In other words, he had made gain by, by crookedness. He's sinfully rich, and socially he's ostracized. He couldn't go into the synagogue, which means how's he going to hear the Word of God? Folks, all, everybody didn't own scrolls. They, they went to the synagogue. You know, in The Chosen, do you all remember how they made it where Matthew didn't know the Scripture? Mm -hmm. He just didn't. Remember, he wanted to learn? That's probably very accurate because he's not allowed in the synagogue. Folks, they were so of, of so bad reputation, they couldn't even testify in a court of law. 
I mean, think about it. You know, we have the same custom here, but it's a little different. When they get a, a witness on the stand and the guy comes up to cross-examine him, what does he try and do? He wants to trip him up, but something even more, discredit him. If they can prove, hey, this guy's been in jail, this guy's known to lie about this or that. And so what did the Jews say about a tax collector? You can't trust nothing, he says. They wouldn't even accept their testimony, again, in a court of law. Now, he is a picture of every single one of us. Folks, we are, because of our sins, so rich in sins, we are barred from the kingdom of God. We're cut off from the courts of God. We're on the outside. We're socially unacceptable. How are we going to get in in that case? Through Him. Through Him. We must be born again. We must be married unto the one that, that owns the kingdom. Okay? Now, um, serving self and at the cost of others. Okay? That's what he was doing. And publicans, again, were also barred from social functions. No one would invite a publican to their wedding. I mean, this is a bad thing. And, you know, we, you try and find someone that we could label like this in our current society. I couldn't think of anyone. You know, different groups ostracize different people, but I really couldn't think of one that we could label like this. Maybe y'all can. I, I couldn't. This is the most hated man in his kind in all of Israel. And who does Christ call? Yeah. Him. You remember, in, uh, I hate to quit keep quoting the chosen, but remember when Jesus in the chosen told uh, one of them, he said, you better get used to different. It was not what they expected, was it? This was not what they expected. All right, now, Matthew had found the pearl of great price. Remember in the parable of the pearl of great price? Man finds it, and what's he willing to do? Sell all. Sell life. everything he has to get it. Now, we've got to draw a line here at for us to... to First, we're not talking about communism. There are people that teach that communism is required to be a believer. Matthew kept his house, didn't he? Yeah. So he didn't have to sell his house. He had money to throw a feast. What a believer must get rid of, what a believer must part with, is whatever keeps us from following Christ. Now, if it turns out that your house is keeping you from following Christ, then get rid of it. But most people, a house is not going to prevent them. But in Matthew's case, what was the main thing preventing him from following Christ? His occupation. How could he continue in that occupation and follow Christ? Well, he could not. He couldn't. He couldn't continue to be a publican. No. And you say, well, do I have to quit my job? No, you don't have to quit your job. The point being is, number one, he can't follow him while he's in the tax booth. But number two, how is he going to claim repentance when he's stealing from people? Right? You know, there's another tax collector that saved later on in Luke. Y'all remember him? Uh, later on? And this tax collector gets saved, and you know what he says when he gets saved? He said, whatever I've stolen, return it fourfold. According to the law. In other words, his heart had been moved. The whole point of this passage today is this. We cannot continue on as we were when we get saved. There is a change that takes place. It doesn't mean you've got to quit your job or you've got to, you know, it doesn't mean any of that. What it means is you can't just take Christ and say, well, I'm going to add that to my life and now I've got something. And that's what a lot of people want to do. They want to go on with their heart set on, in Matthew's case, set on getting rich at the expense of others, right? I don't mean legitimate business. I mean robbing people. And yet he could have said, well, I'll profess to believe that and then I'll have security in my conscience and I can go on doing what I want to do. Now that's American evangelism. Okay? It's not acceptable, is it? And what he's going to tell us is you can't take the new and just tack it on to the old. Now in Matthew's case, the old was not the same as the Pharisees. And we're going to get to that. In Matthew's case, the old was not old theology. It was the old life. He had to get rid of it. Now, let's say one of us, all right, let's say we're, uh, I'm trying to think, okay, I'm going to give you all an example. I'm, I'm always, you know, I find when I use examples, that's the greatest chance you have of, of hurting somebody's feelings and not even knowing it. If I do that, I'm sorry, it's never intentional. I'm going to use myself. I used to be in the bodybuilding, and bodybuilding is all about uh, three things. It's all about food, genetics, and drugs, right? Now, if you don't have one of those three, you're not going to be a bodybuilder. And I had friends. Well, I got saved. 
and I, I had quit bodybuilding, truly got saved, and the next thing you know, I, how am I going to keep doing what I was doing? You can't. Well, I had a friend called me one day because I had been talking to another friend. Wayne remembers Scott. Scott's, uh, he, he died, but Scott's dead now, but Scott got saved. Scott was the guy we all got our drugs from. He, man, he was a nurse, man, he was an expert and could get anything we wanted, and he knew all about it. Another friend called me and, and chewed me out one day. He said, hey, I said, what? He said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? He said, what, what am I going to do for my testosterone when you keep saving everybody? <laughs> now, he was being halfway funny, you know, and joking about it. But what he meant was, guess what happened when Scott got saved? How are you going to go on doing that? How are you going to go on selling drugs? You can't. See, something, may, and it doesn't mean it's got to be drastic all at once, folks. We go on repenting. But there is a change of direction that takes place, isn't there? And in Matthew's case, it's drastic, isn't it? And the, the examples that the Lord uses in the Gospels usually are dramatic, so we get the point. Okay, so now, um, in leaving all, he still had a house. Okay? So again, it's not a call to communism. But I want to just go over and talk about what this is all about. Now let's look at the Pharisees' objections. In verse 30, but their scribes and Pharisees. Now it says their scribes to set a, it mean these scribes are Pharisees, they're not Sadducees. Both groups had their scribes. So here come the Pharisees and their expert teachers. It said, they murmured against his disciples. What's that make y'all think of? Murmuring. Out in the wilderness, isn't it? What was Israel's big sin out in the wilderness? Murmuring against the way God was doing things. What are the Pharisees doing here? Murmuring against the way God's doing things. And it says, they said, Why do ye, that's plural, all of you, eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Now, according to the Pharisees' teaching, certain types of people are not eligible for fellowship. And guess who was number one on the list? Publicans. Later on, we'll find out the, those that they called sinners were those that didn't live according to the Pharisees' traditions. And I know that sounds strange to us, but I know people that say, if you're not a Baptist, you're going to hell. Y'all know anybody of that mindset? I know people that say, if you're not of this, you're going to hell, or you're not of that. I know people that say all the Baptists are going to hell except our Baptist church, and I'm not picking on Baptists. I'm, I, but this is the truth. Folks, we get very narrow-minded in religion, don't we? So the Pharisees thought, what in the world is this man doing with these people? They're unfit for any rabbi. They have no idea this is the Son of God. And yet he just proved he's the Son of God by healing the paralytic. See, they think he's just another teacher and he's gathering some followers. So they come down to compare notes with him and whatnot. And immediately they write him off, not only as Messiah. He can't be the Messiah. They never consider that. This man can't even be a legitimate teacher because look who he's trying to teach. Does that make sense? So they come in with that attitude. Now, to eat with these people was to share in their sin. That's how the Pharisees looked at it. In other words, if you sit down and had a meal with these people, well, then you were underwriting what they were doing. All right? Now, this eliminated not only Christ as a teacher, but I want you all to think about it. It eliminated them for salvation. Here's the two groups. The, the low lives sitting and eating with Christ and the Pharisees standing on the outside. Isn't that a perfect picture? They're standing on the outside of Christ, and what's keeping them from coming to Christ? Pride. Their pride of religion, their own ideas, their own beliefs, their own possessions, their own righteousness. Okay, They won't let go of it. Now, Christ did not mingle with sinners like a comrade in sin. This wasn't, you know, honor among thieves. Folks, Christ did not do that. Watch what He says He's doing. Watch how He answers them. Now, Jesus does not deny that this is a bunch of unclean sinners. They are. If He came in here today, what would He find? A bunch of unclean sinners, right? But what He is trying to show the Pharisees is they're just as unclean, and that's the thing they won't accept. So he answers like this. Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole, or you know, in good health, need not a physician, but they that are sick. Now that's an old, ancient, old saying, they say. It goes way back. We say it today. Who goes to the doctor? 
sick people. Now look, in these days, you didn't go to the doctor. There weren't hospitals. The doctor came to you. So in other words, where do you find the doctor at? in the house of sick people. Isn't that a perfect answer? What are you doing with these people? He said, well, what's any doctor doing? He's there with the sick. Okay, so this is what he means. Now, <clears throat> something about a doctor I made in my notes to try and remember this. Isn't it something how a doctor spends all his time with sick people yet doesn't seem to get sick? You ever think, I'm not saying they don't get sick, but according to logic, they ought to be sick 365 days a year, shouldn't they? Mm -hmm. Now, we can try and explain it and say, well, they build up an immunity and a whatever, whatever, but in the case of God, have y'all ever noticed how when a family gets sick, God keeps somebody healthy? Mm -hmm. You ever notice that? Always will. I mean, that's His universal grace. He does this. I notice when I get sick, Lexi's not sick. When I get over it and I'm okay, then Lexi gets it. I mean, this is how God works. Folks, it's grace. And so in the case of Jesus Christ, what I want you all to see, Christ went into that house, no more a chance of him getting sick than it was of a doctor getting sick, and in fact, far less. How could these people's uncleanness make the Son of God unclean? It can't. That's just the Pharisees' belief. You see, the Pharisees ha had, a, had a very perverted uh, view of religion. Now, what did a Pharisee believe saved him? His being separate. Pharisee means divided. It means a separatist, okay? I'm going to put us a timeline. Lexi, I'm going to try not to get this everywhere, okay? Boy, y'all would not believe the beating I got after y'all left last time. <laughs> okay, so the Pharisees come along, and the Pharisee believes, I'll just put him up here. Again, the very word itself means to divide. A Pharisee believed that his position was based on his separation. Separation from unclean things. Separation from breaking certain traditions and all this stuff. In other words, he trusted his clean performance, right? Now, that's a Pharisee. Now, who is the greatest example of a Pharisee that we can find in our Bible? Saul of Tarsus, Paul. Folks, Paul said the Pharisees were the cream of the crop, and he said, and I was the cream of the cream. And yet, what did he say had to happen for him to be saved? He said he threw it all out like dung. He had to change. Folks, he had a drastic conversion, didn't he? Now, there are those that would say, Matthew just gave up everything. If you say that, I wonder if you've ever met Christ. Folks, Matthew didn't give up nothing. Matthew gained everything. I mean, they, look, uh, if, if you hadn't watched The Chosen, please watch it. <laughs> They do a wonderful job in that movie, and I'm not saying everything in there is, you know, I'm just telling you, they do a wonderful job in there of showing the thrill that Matthew, folks, Matthew is a, he was, his family wanted nothing to do with him. The only friend he had in the world, two friends, a centurion soldier that liked him, whether he would admit it or not, and a dog. Can you imagine a Jew with a dog? I mean, seriously. I mean, it's, it's horrible for a Jew. And yet there he is, and he's got all the money in the world. He's got everything he needs except one thing. No happiness, no peace of mind. And he, he hears about Jesus, and, he see, and when Jesus comes walking by, it's my, probably my favorite thing. He walks by, and he stops, and he just turns around, and he looks at him. And everything's going on, and in the stop of all that, he said, Matthew, son of Alphaeus. And he looked up at him, he said, follow me. And boy, he took off everything and dropped it down and gave the centurion his key, remember? Did he lose anything? No. Folks, he began to gain everything. Do you think Matthew today is gri uh, griping about the income he lost? No. So Matthew, again, is a great picture of this. Now, these Pharisees, the Pharisees are offset in our Scripture by the publican. And look, this is how the Bible teaches. It teaches by comparison. Could you get someone more elevated in the Jewish mind than the Pharisee? Could you get someone lower than the publican? You remember when Luke uses them in Luke 18? Pharisee walks into the temple, standing on his feet, looks up to heaven, proud of himself, and says, Thank God I'm not like other men are. 
Remember? And he reads off his religious accomplishments and he ends by saying, but above everything, Lord, thank God I'm not like that poor publican. Oh, that filthy wretch. What does the publican do? He ain't paying no attention to the Pharisee. He's on his face before God begging for mercy. Christ said he went home justified. Don't let someone trick you and try and say he was. Folks, justified means justified before God, just as if he'd never sinned. He got saved. How was he saved? The Lord called him. Why did that Pharisee fall down on his face that way? God called him. He began to reveal things to him. Why did Matthew leave everything and follow Christ? Because Christ called him. Now, this is the call of the Lord. All right, sinners sitting and eating with Christ while the Pharisees stand without in judgment. You know, there's a statement the Lord makes here. Y'all go over to Matthew 23. In Matthew 23, He really lowers the boom on the Pharisees. But he says something in particular in verse 13 that I want to point out. Now look, as we go over this, I want you all to kind of picture these two people in the same setting, right? We'll just say in the same Bible study, okay? And a Pharisee today, folks, we got plenty of Pharisees today, lots and lots of them, and we've got plenty of publicans, lots and lots of them, but today I want you to picture both of them in some event where Christ is preaching, in a church, in wherever, and they're both there, Bible study, whatever it is. And not only d does the Pharisee not want to hear what's being preached, what does he also want to do? He wants to keep this guy from hearing it. Now watch what the Lord says in 23.13. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. They had changed God's law to nothing but tradition. Christ said they made the law of no effect by their tradition. So not only were they entering into the kingdom, but that wasn't enough. What did they want to do at the same time? They wanted to prevent anybody else from going in. Now you say, why would they want to do that? Well, what did they think was going to happen when, if Jesus amassed the following? He was going to take from them. They're, the, they're in the driver's seat, right? Y'all know I see this all the time. It's, you see it all the time in Bible studies. Somebody will come to a Bible study and they'll tell you, oh, I, I'm, yeah, I know my Bible and whatnot. And I'm not saying they don't, but I'll tell you what, as soon as they hear something they don't like, not only do they not like it, they begin fighting within themselves to try and make it fit into their you know, ideas. And then when it won't, then after class, if you listen good, you'll hear them going around talking to other people, letting them know, no, not here, not there. Folks, they're doing, they think they're doing something right. Didn't the Pharisees think they were doing the right thing? They thought that they were the righteous that Christ did not come to call. That's right. If, if Christ came to call the unrighteous sinner, well, then the Pharisees said, I don't, why would I need that? We're righteous because of who we are and because of our traditions and law. So the Pharisee was never in a position of needing saved. You know when you preach the gospel today, how many times you preach to people that already have decided they're saved? And whatever you preach, if it goes against or if it cuts against the grain, they'll, they'll do exactly what Jesus is going to say in a minute. They'll take the thing that they see in Scripture, and it's like a kid putting them shapes in the, in the, you know what I mean? And when they can't get it to fit in any of it, what do they do? They throw it aside and then start telling everybody else, don't try and fit it in there now. Look, that's what lost people do. And the more religion we have, the more we do it. So um, in Matthew 23, I want to read the next verse too. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, for a pretense make long prayer, therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Now what he's talking about here is, what were they professing? Righteousness. They were professing righteousness, and yet who was the real thief? The Pharisee. Folks, this publican was a physical thief. The Pharisee was a spiritual thief. He's going to get somebody to follow him, and where's he going to lead them? In the hell. They're not going into the kingdom themselves, and yet they prevent others. Okay. <clears throat> now, Christ reply to this. I love it. He basically says, yep, I came to call sinners to repentance. 
Notice what he says. Let's get back over here to Luke 5. This is like his mission statement. You all know when you look on a website, they'll, lots of times they'll have their mission statement, what their, what their purpose is. Well, here's Christ. In Luke 5.32, he said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, is he suggesting that there are some men that are righteous and don't need saving? No. He's suggesting that there are some that think they're righteous and think they don't need saving. Now, who thinks they're righteous and doesn't need saving? Folks, it's not the lost world in general. Uh, you'd go talk to the lost world and they'll all say, well, nobody's perfect. I mean, I know, you know, right? Who are the people that insist, will fight you tooth and nail and insist that they do not need to be saved? The ones in church. The ones that have been in church all their life and think they're saved. I'm not saying they're all lost. I'm just telling you that's the representation of the Pharisees. The Pharisee thought he was righteous because of something he had done or, or you know, professed or whatever. Now he says here, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I want y'all to notice, what comes first, the call or the repentance? The call. The call. The religious world's got this out of, out of order today. How do they teach it? If you will turn from this, this, and this, then you can be saved. The Bible is how you're going to turn from that when you have no power to do it. The Bible is until you are regenerated, how are you going to do anything? Folks, all a sinner can do is serve self. And even when we think we're serving someone else, if we dig down in it, self's the, the motivation. You know, I, many a thing I do around here, and honestly, I do it to keep from breaking my dinner plate. Don't we men do a lot of stuff like that? You know, we, we just, uh, I, Lexi had to drive to the store. Uh, about two weeks ago, she had to drive to Walmart. Y'all know where Walmart's at, don't you? Yeah. You know, I'm still hearing about that. <laughs> and she says it in a nonchalant way. What, oh, that was that day I went to Walmart by myself. She, she don't like driving, so, it's, so I get up and drive places when I'd rather be doing something else. And you say, well, you're doing it because you love her. I do love her, but honestly, I'm just doing it because it's easier to just do it. Eh? <laughs> but anyway... Um, you know, speaking of driving, we had something. I, I just love watching the Lord work, and Sienna pointed it out to me, and that made me even happier. He, we uh, got out of class Thursday night, and car would do nothing. Dead as a doornail. I mean, no lights, nothing. So I figured, battery, I must have left something on. He's jumping. Jump it, nothing. It wouldn't do nothing. And make a long story short, we, we wound up, we didn't get home to super late. And anyway, we got the car fixed and all, but Sienna pointed something out to me. She said, uh, isn't it good that the Lord got us to class before that happened? Oh, yeah. He did, didn't he? Yeah. And I got to thinking about it and I said, you know what, Sienna? We made two stops on the way over there. And not only did we not not stop the car, we didn't even get out. Now, normally I'd get out, but I took Lexi by the UPS store, gave her curb service because it was raining and I didn't want her highness to get wet. <laughs> but then we went to Target. We were early for class and she needed something. We went to Target and I'll always go in there, but for some reason I just said I'll stay in the car and kept the car running. If I had killed the car at either place, we wouldn't have made class. You see, the point got, this is the providence of God always. Well, when he calls Matthew and Matthew makes the feast, when did the Lord Jesus Christ know that he was going to save Matthew? Before the foundation of the world. Did he know Matthew was going to make a feast? Did he know who was going to be there? Folks, Jesus Christ that day is keeping an appointment God made for him before the foundation of the world. And there he goes, he's in there keeping that appointment. Okay? <clears throat> now, we have got to accept Christ's diagnosis before we can be called. Before you can get the effectual calling, you've got to accept the diagnosis. What's the diagnosis the Holy Spirit makes on those He's going to save? I am a sinner. Sinner unclean. Okay, and the only way you can honestly say that in a, in a true repentant... Look, anybody will admit they're not perfect and I'm a sinner, but there's always a but in it. The only way a person is ever led to an honest confession of sin and worthiness of hell is when the Holy Spirit's begin to work on them. And so uh, we've got to accept that diagnosis. Now, Christ's power to heal is greater than sin's power to kill. 
I mean, think about it. Christ goes in here, no chance of Him getting dirty or unclean. It's because we don't get dirty and unclean by the outside things. A man's made dirty and unclean by that which is within him. We're born with it. Only Christ wasn't born with it. So here he is, clean amongst the unclean. Now again, the Pharisee believed that salvation was due to segregation. Okay? And they taught that salvation is by uh, association. You know, birds of a feather, that sort of thing. So when they saw a sinner coming down the road, what did the Pharisee do? Turn away. they go to the other side. And when the people, common people saw them coming, they would bow their heads and back away. That's how they acted. Okay? They were that sort of a, a, a thing. Um, but Jesus talking about being in the house of the sick, it's kind of fascinating to me. They say, what in the world are you doing in there amongst those people? And he says, essentially, where else would you expect to find a doctor? Right? It, it reminds me of something I heard one time. Uh, anybody ever watch MASH? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, remember old Frank Burns? Oh, yeah. I mean, he just ridiculous, you know. Y'all notice, by the way, they throw a Bible in his hand, don't they, to make him look like a fool. But Frank Burns said one time he would like being a doctor if it wasn't for all the sick people. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? And you think about that statement. Folks, that's essentially what's going on here. It's like, well, I mean, I can see Christ has you know, come to do something, but amongst these people... He, you know, William Booth started the Salvation Army. Are y'all familiar with his... Mr. Bailey probably knows some of the things about William Booth. Do y'all know what William Booth experienced when he got saved? He wanted to tell somebody. He didn't know who to tell. So he went out and found a bunch of people that were hard up. It was hard times, soup kitchen, that sort of thing. Look, I'm not talking about lazy professional bums conning people. I'm talking about hard times. He went and found them, hobos and everything else, and rounded them all up and brought them to church on Sunday. And guess what happened? They got sick. They kicked him out of the church. They kicked him out of his church. So he went and formed the Salvation Army, which used to be an actual really good gospel preaching organization. But why did they kick them people out of the church? Telling the truth sometimes. Yeah. They didn't want to associate with them. They were modern day Pharisees. What were they? So called Christians. Modern day church. Yeah, modern day church. Look, and not all. I'm not trying to paint everybody. I'm just telling you, this still happens. I'm going to give you an example. When I got saved, all I knew is I had to tell somebody. And the Lord began to put it on my heart to, to you got to share this. You got, and to, I mean, to, to preach it just like you, if you can say no, if a person tells me God called them, but they said no, I don't believe He called them because I've experienced what it is and you just don't deny it. I didn't know what to do. I tried to go here. Nobody wants to hear it, so I'm trying. And it occurred to me, you know what? Nursing home. A nursing home, those people are old and they're, you know, they're, many of them are close to death and I bet a lot of them haven't heard the gospel and they'd be, so I started going to nursing homes. Well, immediately we had a couple people that heard the gospel and, and got, you know, saved and they wanted to talk about, you know, how do, we, uh, how do we become church members and how do we, you know, according to our doctrine, they had to be baptized. I'm not saying that's right, but that's what they taught. So I went back to the church, Wayne, you remember? And I said, look, I got a couple people that want to be baptized. And you know what the people in the church did? Not Wayne, but you know what the other people did? Now wait on a minute, hold on. Who are these people? And I said, well, there are these. Ah, they're probably not even really sincere. They'll just tell you anything. And I said, no, it, you know, they're sincere. And whether they were or not is not the issue. What did Christ command us to do? Go forth and teach, baptizing, teaching. And so the, the guy that called himself the preacher, the new guy that had took over, come over to the nursing home. He said, I'll look into it. He come over there to one of my classes and he sat there and listened to me teach. And what was over? Now, this is a guy that shares the gospel with nobody. Nobody at that place shares the gospel since Wayne left. That's just a heartbreaking truth. They're a little clique that are hanging on and that we've got it. Don't let anybody. It's like a little club. Is that accurate, Wayne? It's heartbreaking, but it's the truth. But he come to this class. After the class was over, he come up and he said, yeah, there's nothing to this. None of these people are really sincere. And that was the end of it. You think about that. What if they weren't sincere? Were they still willing to hear? I went over there for years. It ain't up to me whether they hear or not. Who cares about that? That's not my job. That's the Lord's job. You see, what He really meant was we don't want them people in here. And they got rid of me pretty fast. And the main reason they got rid of me, they said it was because of uh, 
the King James Bible, but that's not the reason. That's the one they used. The main reason they got rid of me is because there was a pressure there to witness, honestly. And I had begun teaching, and there was a pressure there that, hey, what is this guy doing? And I also had a good friend who, who was black, and he started coming. And that started causing issues. One preacher kept making comments to him, and other people, a family member made horrible comment to him. And all. In other words, when is all this element coming into our little group? we got to get rid of this. And folks, they got rid of it. That's what's going on with these Pharisees. Who is this man showing up claiming to be teaching from the Scriptures? That's our job. And so what do they go to do? Discredit him. And if you're looking for a reason to discredit someone, you can find it. But could they find a legitimate reason with Christ? And so Christ absolutely turned them in a knot. I mean, he just he flipped them upside down every time they tried to uh, catch him in something. And his answer again is, I came to call sinners to repentance. Now, if we accept Christ's diagnosis, then the next thing we've got to do is we've got to understand that his fix must be correct. Look, when a doctor makes the right diagnosis, let's say you've been to 10 doctors and nobody gets it. You finally go to one and he puts his finger on the right diagnosis. What are you then going to do? Keep going. Huh? Follow his treatment and follow you. That's it, right? Well, when he puts the diagnosis on, y'all know what the diagnosis is like. You sitting back there and you say, man, this guy's talking to me. Hey, this is me. That book's describing me. Well, if you realize it's the correct diagnosis, then follow on with Christ. Folks, Matthew got up and got on with it and never looked back. Now, that doesn't mean someone can't fall back and pick back. We can. But in Matthew's case, we're never told that he did. He got up and he followed Christ. Now, the second objection they have, uh, quickly, we'll talk about it. It says in verse 33, They said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink? Y'all consider this. They're mad who he's eating and drinking with. Matter of fact, they're mad that he's even eating and drinking. See? Why are you eating and drinking with those people? And when that won't stop him, they said, well, why are you eating and drinking at all? This ain't a time to eat and drink. And they bring up this fasting. Now, this is something important. Fasting, there is only one commanded fast in the Old Testament. Y'all realize that? In the Law of Moses, there's one commanded fast. It's on the Day of Atonement. It's actually the day before. For 24 hours before the Day of Atonement, they were to afflict their souls and eat nothing and pray and mourn over it. In other words, they were to think on their sins and mourn for their need for a, a cleansing, right? Well, why would the Pharisees fast in twice a week? That's a long ways from one fast to twice a week. What's twice a week? Let's see, 52, 104. They went from 1 to 104. Why? Because that's how it went through the Old Testament. They started adding. You get over a few, few books later and you find that they've got fast months. They fast in this month and in that month and that month. And then by the time we get down to the Pharisees, it's 104 fasts a year. Did God tell them to do that? Yeah. Then are they keeping the law of God? They're keeping their traditions. And what is the thing that was so important to the Pharisee? Tradition. Tradition. Okay. Now, can you imagine Matthew fasting on this day? No. Folks, you ain't going to get Matthew to fast on this day. How are you going to get him to be... I mean, imagine these Pharisees show up to this feast... Matthew, number one, ain't even been able to eat dinner with anybody other than these other bums, or uh, bums, these tax collectors. And yet here he is. He has met salvation. His sins have been paid for. He's got joy unspeakable, full of glory. And the Pharisees show up and say, where's the sackcloth and the ashes? Can you all imagine? How does Jesus answer him? He said, who ever heard of fasting at a wedding? A wedding ain't a time for fasting. A wedding's a time for rejoicing. I mean, imagine walking into a wedding reception and telling everybody, put it all down now, we got to mourn. Well, what do you think about the bride or the groom, right? I mean, if you tell them to mourn, he, my, I'm going to tell a quick one just because it's funny to me, but the, my dad's best friend, he got married, the last time he got married before he died, my dad's best friend called the lady aside and 
apologize to her. He said, I want to go ahead and apologize to you now that I didn't stop this thing. Now think about that. I mean, that really says something, doesn't it? Do you think he was saying something about the bride or the groom? The groom. Well, what are they saying this day? Where's the sackcloth and the ashes? And how in the world are you going to get Matthew to mourn on this day? Folks, you couldn't have wiped the smile off Matthew's face. When you get saved, is that a time for weeping and mourning? No. And that's what Christ answers. No, not, it, it doesn't fit. Okay? Um, Christ answers again. This is a time for celebrating. Now, the Pharisees' fastings again. Look, John's disciples fasted for a different reason. John taught fasting, John the Baptist, to show a true remorse over sin, a true repentance, and what was John teaching them to look for? The coming Messiah. Now, in the Old Testament, there are times, not under the law where it's commanded, set times, but are there uh, due times for fasting in the Old Testament? Yeah. When Israel was about to, when they had fallen into such idolatry and they're about to be conquered, what did the kings tell them to do? Good king. Stop what you do and fast. We're going to fast. In other words, put away your daily life and what's important and let's get on our knees and beg God to turn. You know, even the men of Nineveh did that. Israel's worst enemy in the book of Jonah. God sent Jonah to Nineveh, the worst city in the world at the time, and told the king and all the people, you got 40 days and God's going to wipe you out. And you know what the king did? He believed him. You know what he did next? He made it illegal that day to eat. He said, that's it. Everybody, sackcloth and ashes and fasting. And the whole nation got on their knees and prayed all day, nonstop begging God not to pour wrath out on them. And guess what? God didn't pour out wrath. What do y'all think America needs? Folks, it ain't going to be Trump in office that fixes our problem. It ain't going to be anything else. The only thing that will ever fix our problem is that sort of thing. Turning to God and screaming out, we are wrong. We deserve wrath. But in the case of fasting, they would also fast when they mourned. Y'all remember when David's child was sick? He wouldn't eat anything. You find times when they fasted, and you find that there are New Testament times that are proper for fasting. There's a lot of fasting in the book of Acts. Read Acts. Paul did a lot of fasting, didn't he? What is, what is fasting essentially saying, modernly? What's it saying? I'm special, those others don't fast? It's saying that I've got a spiritual issue that takes precedence over all the physical. And I, it's this important to me and I'm focusing on. That's all it means, okay? And it's no different than it's showing self-control. And again, who in the world goes to a wedding to show self-control? We don't, okay? And that's what Christ is answering to them here. All right, tell you what, we're going to stop here and take a break and then we'll come back and pick it up right there. <laughs>